أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي اتق الله ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين إن الله كان عليما حكيما واتبع ما يوحى إليك من ربك إن الله كان بما تعملون خبيرا وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we are about to embark on uh, the study of a very unique madani surah in the quran surah al ahzab uh, it's a fairly challenging surah to study also it has some very unique subjects that aren't anywhere else in the quran there are two major things that Oh, we're going to study in the surah. Uh, one of them is the battle of Al-Ahzab. That's going to be two passages, the second and the third passage of the surah. The two, the second and third ruku' you can say of the surah are going to deal with Allah's commentary on that passage. But the first ruku' is going to go join with the fourth ruku' and deal with uh, a, a specific incident in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, dealing with the marriage, uh, the Prophet's marriage with Zainab radiallahu anha. The Prophet ﷺ married uh, one of the mothers of the believers. Her name is Zainab and he, her marriage to her, his marriage to her. Now, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I want to give you an overview. This surah in its subject matter is very similar in its style to Surah An-Nur. And in Surah An-Nur, the, you know, uh, battle and victory was alluded to. Here, we're actually going to see commentary on battle. There, we saw social laws, the ethics of being inside the house, how men are supposed to be separated from the women, asking of permission, how you're supposed to be seated when you invite people over, you go to people's houses, things like that, right? So that was the, the, the separation of genders and the respect that either gender is supposed to show one another, who are your mahrams, who are your non-mahrams. The khimar is mentioned. And the khimar is uh, uh, you know, the, what we call the hijab, basically, right? But here we're going to see, instead of the home situation, we're going to see the outside situation. So again, social laws are going to be mentioned. Interaction is going to be mentioned, but Allah is going to talk about how women should be dressed outside the home. And the, the, the entire, uh, um, you know, in, the, the ethics of, of engagement outside the home are going to be talked about. So these two surahs together form basically our principles of the, the laws of haya. The laws, not the ethics of them. The ethics are everywhere else, but the laws of them are between these two surahs. Now a little bit about... Another thing that ties these surahs together, there was a controversy surrounding the mother of the believers. So we had a controversy surrounding Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Here there's a controversy surrounding the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or some munafiqoon tried to raise it as a controversy. The Prophet sallallahu has a, a slave. Uh, he's been there raised in that house. His name is Zayd radiallahu anhu. And Zayd radiallahu anhu is very close and very dear to the Prophet ﷺ, so much so that he calls him his son, out of love, he calls Zayd his son. And actually it was, it was coined, people used to go around and saying, Zayd bin Muhammad, Zayd the son of Muhammad, that's how they used to refer to him. You have to understand also the Prophet ﷺ lost sons, and this was the only boy being raised in the house, so there's a, there's a special connection with this person. So when we think of slave, we think of somebody who's going to live in the back shackles and like, he's going to be treated poorly and not considered an equal. It's not the case with Zayd radiallahu anhu, who's literally a member of the family. That's how he's treated. So Zayd radiallahu anhu, uh, even though he's very close to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, at the end of the day, he's still a slave. And when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam moves to Medina, he uh, recommends uh, Zainab radiallahu anha to marry him. Zaynab's family doesn't like the idea. Zainab herself, radiallahu anha, doesn't, she's from the Hashimi clan, she's an elite woman. She's raised up in, the, in that kind of a different social setting. So for her to marry someone who's a slave was kind of a social problem. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to, I mean this was, there's many wisdoms in that, and one of them absolutely is that we're not a class society, that it's not, Islam doesn't prohibit people to marry across different classes. But even though that's the case, the prohibition of it is removed. And he recommends highly to Zainab and her family, despite her reluctance, because it's coming, the recommendation is coming from the Prophet ﷺ, the marriage happens. 
But even though Islam doesn't prohibit it, doesn't take away the fact that when people come from very different backgrounds and very different lifestyles, then they may not be compatible with each other. So you have to take those things into consideration. In the, in the first generation, among the Sahaba, marriage was a very common reality, and so was divorce. They, did this, they would discover that they're not meant for each other, or they're not a good match, they're not compatible with each other, and divorce was not a big deal. It was, it's, it's bad, it's, you know, it's makruh, etc. It's not so, like an easy thing that you just get divorced, but it's not the end of the world either. You didn't become ostracized, and you didn't become you know, marked that you are just, you're this cursed person, that something must be wrong with you that you got divorced. It's just a fact of life. It's a difficult fact of life, but it's a fact of life. And Sahaba moved on and remarried. It was no big deal. Now, Zayd radiallahu anhu, just, it didn't work out with Zainab. And Zayd and, and Zainab was not, radiallahu anha, not happy with the marriage. So the Prophet ﷺ kept coming to Zayd and saying, she's not happy, she's not happy, can I let her go? Can I divorce her? And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to save the marriage, and he kept recommending him to keep the marriage as much as possible. Until it got to the point of no return. So the Prophet ﷺ is now in a difficult position because he's the one that actually recommended this marriage to happen, and now it's coming apart. And Zainab anha and her family are going to be heartbroken, especially Zainab anha. And he realizes that as soon as this divorce happens, the only real way to mend that heart is going to be that he's going to have to marry her. Okay? So because, you know, and that will alleviate the ill feeling, and it will also be, it also will demonstrate that there's nothing wrong with marrying, with marrying her, and there's nothing wrong with her either. So because, you know, his love for Zayd is obvious. But his love for Zainab عنها, as a Sahabiya is not necessarily obvious. So people might think what? Who's at fault? Obviously. The people are not going to think Zayd's at fault because Zayd عنه, is in the family of the Prophet So he wants to make sure that that's also not the case, that she doesn't get labeled unnecessarily. So he you know, uh, extends the hand and you know, when she gets divorced, he marries her. But a controversy rises. Because among the Arabs there was a tradition that if your son, for example, had a wife, your daughter-in-law, and the son died, or the son divorced, or that you can't marry your daughter-in-law, that's wrong. And so the munafiqun tried to raise this as an issue. Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is, that's not his son. And that's not his son. That's not literally his son. Calling him your son doesn't make him your son. Now, calling somebody a relationship was done in two ways in the Arab tradition. It was done in two ways. It was done out of extreme love, and it was done out of extreme hate. Okay, so there's two ways that they would call somebody. So for example, out of extreme love, Zayd is my son. Instead of saying Zayd is like my son, just saying Zayd is my son. Okay, that's out of love. But then there's husband and wife getting into a fight. And the husband says, from today on, you are as haram for me as my own mother. This is what they would say. And this was called dihar. It was a disgusting thing to say, but they used to do it. It was called dihar. And the idea is, of course, you wouldn't know, nobody would think of their mother, and therefore I will not think of you ever again. We're done, we're finished. And Allah Azza wa Jal addresses this, actually a surah that addresses this problem, because the Sahabi had a fight with the Sahabi, and he told her, you're my mother from today on, or you are, to, I'll think of you like I think of my mother. We're done. And she came to the Prophet and he, that's what he called me. You know, what should I do, what should I do? And the Prophet didn't say anything until the surah is revealed. And the surah is revealed and tells this man calling him, you can call, call her whatever you want, she's not going to be your mom, your mom is your mom. So out of hate or out of love, just giving somebody a name or a relationship does not legitimize it in Islam. And this was important to note also because Sahaba had so much love for each other, like فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ They're your brothers in deen, in Surah Al-Anfal we learned that. They're your brothers in deen, the Muhajirun and the Ansar have such a such muakhat, such brotherhood among them, that they're like brothers to each other, and they start thinking when the ayat of inheritance came down, you know your brother has a share, right? So they start thinking, does the muhajir have the share in the ansari's you know, uh, uh, leavings? Or, or not? And so Allah had to reveal, وَأُلُولْ أَرْحَامِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْضٍ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ in Surah Al-Anfal. No, the, the connections of the womb, they take priority. In the law of Allah. The law of Allah only applies to the connections of the womb. Just calling somebody your brother doesn't make them a, a, an heir to your inheritance. However, if you promise them something while you're still alive, you name one of your stores to them. You put one of, one of your houses in your brother's name, in your friend's name. No problem. 
that's not inheritance. That's because you're still alive right now. Once you die, it's only family members and the ones that Allah has written in His book. So the difference between the brotherhood and camaraderie that you can show as, you know, and sadaqah and giving and charitability, that had to be separated from the law, the letter of the law. And the law is, it's only for family members. And it's the same way, you can hate your wife and call her your mother, doesn't matter what you call her, you can call her an elephant or a giraffe, she'll still be your wife. That's still the case. That doesn't change anything. And the same way, even no matter how much you love Zayd, and you can call him your son, and people call him your son, he is still not your son. And that kind of ended, that cut the controversy at its roots. So that we're going we're to read about that. Ya ayyuhan nabi, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nabi, ittaqillah wa la tuti'il kafirin. Prophet, be cautious of Allah, beware of Allah. Implies don't be afraid of anything that other people are saying. You know, nowadays in Arabic, when you say ittaqillah, it's like a, it's like a bad thing to say something. Ittaqillah ya rajul. Fear Allah. So, but it's not Allah scolding the Messenger والسلام, Allah is telling the Messenger والسلام, fear him, be cautious of him, and don't worry about anybody else. وَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ Don't worry about the disbelievers. Don't follow, actually also means, إِطَاعَ also means to take influence. Don't be influenced by the disbelievers. وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ And the hypocrites. Because this tradition of not marrying your son, Urdu me kate mu bola beta. I just called you, pronounced him your son and he's your son. This tradition was looked down upon not only in Medina, but also in Mecca. So the Kuffar were talking about it and taking suit, following behind. The Munafiqun were also using it, the hypocrites were also using it as an issue. Inna Allah kana aliman hakima, no doubt Allah is all knowledgeable, perfectly wise, fully wise. In other words, Allah could have revealed to the Prophet not to marry Zainab. Allah could have revealed that to him, but he didn't. He waited till this whole thing happened, and then Allah revealed the surah because this had to happen so that lessons could be learned from it. وَاتَّبِعْ مَا يُوحَى إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ And follow only what has been, or follow what has been revealed to you, inspired to you, from your master. You don't have to follow any pressures. You have to follow revelation. إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرًا No doubt Allah in regards to what the rest of you have been up to, all of you have been up to, has had full news. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And you continue to trust Allah. Don't think that this is going to undermine your efforts. You see, this is a domestic situation, but the Prophet ﷺ is in the middle of some very serious issues. He's got the, the opposition of Quraysh, which is now military opposition. He's got the treachery of the Jewish tribes in Medina, two of whom have been expelled. Banu Nuzayr have been expelled, Banu Qaynaqa have been expelled. You know, and Banu Qurayda is on the other side. They're, they're fortified on the other, in the western end of, Mac, of, uh, of uh, Medina. So he's got some serious issues to deal with. And then there's this domestic situation. And you know what this does? It destroys the morale of an army when the leader has a domestic or a private controversy. It can destroy the morale of an army. How do they destroy people in the election campaigns? Problem at home, problem in the marriage. You know, personal thing. That's, that's how they get at you. So this is something that's, you know, for you and me, a personal situation is a personal situation. But when somebody takes a position of leadership, those things can become like catastrophes. Those small things can become very, very big. Because everything they do is under a microscope. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Continue to place your trust in Allah. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And Allah is enough to uh, uh, dispose of your affairs, meaning take care of your problems. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّن قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah did not place two hearts inside of any man. Allah did not place two hearts inside of any man at all. In other words, if a man just doesn't have love for his wife, it's not like he has one heart that has love for her and the other that doesn't. That's one implication of the ayah. If he couldn't, doesn't want to stay, stay married to her, then he can't. He can't just find love for her out of nowhere. If it's gone, it's gone. It happens. The literal meaning, Allah did not put two hearts inside of any man I've talked about in divine speech, is, you know, uh, the fact that men are mentioned and women aren't mentioned, even from a literal point of view, and then jawf is mentioned. Jawf means something hollow, something that's empty on the inside. And that's actually used for the torso of the human body. That all of it is essentially, it's not bone, it's basically from be behind the chest cavity all the way down to your belly. It's just this hollow structure that's being held up. And it's just filled with our organs, etc. But it's really a hollow piece. So Allah says, in that hollow, in that torso of the human body, Allah did not put two hearts of any man. And, you know, beautifully, women, when they get pregnant, have what? Two hearts inside of them. SubhanAllah. And he didn't even say sadr, he said jawf. It's so beautiful. If he said sadr, means chest, 
Well, yeah, then men or women don't have two hearts in their chest, but they do have them inside of their torso, inside of the body. So the, jof, the word jof is mentioned. But really in the context of the conversation, what this means is you can't, you can't love and hate at the same time. If, if, if you've reached a point of no return in that marriage, then it has to come to an end. وَمَا جَعَلَ أَزْوَاجُكُمُ اللَّائِي تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ And the women, your spouses, the ones that you have done dhihar with, dhihar means, means that you've, aggre you've uh, uh, literally been aggressive towards them. Vahara is used when an army attacks another. So you've done an act of aggression against your wife by calling her your mother, etc. اللَّائِي تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ The one that you've engaged in an act of such aggression with, uh, and even the meaning is kind of, I know there's children here, so I don't want to spell it out for you, but it's enough that what I've said is disturbing enough. Now, minhunna ummahatikum. They're not your, the, those women are not, wa ma ja'ala Allah, Allah did not make them your mothers, just because you call them that. Wa ma ja'ala ad'iyaukum abna. And that's, that's the side of hate, that you called your wife your mother. But then on the side of love, and he didn't just say, the ones that you call ad'iyaukum, the ones you call with son, come here. Oh my son, listen please. You know, Zayd, you, the Prophet has a right to call him Ibni. My son, just come here. Bunayya, my son, come here. But Allah says, just because you call him like that, Allah did not make them your sons. ذَلِكُمْ قَوْلُكُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ That's just stuff you're saying. That's just you talking casually. Afwah is mentioned here. Because it's just casual talk, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. You know, this applies to not just these two relationships. It applies across the board. Pakistani families, Indian families, Bangladeshi families, listen up. آج کے بعد تم میرے بیٹے نہیں ہو. You know, what? You're not my son after today. No, I, I'm still your son. See my last name? Still same last name. See my face? Looks like you. Still your son. Say it all you want. Okay? And you, and we love these overly dramatic things, not just in Arab culture, we do it in every culture. You know? We learn it from childhood, kutti. You know, this is no it or not. From today on, you're not my friend ever again. Sisters do it. T from today on, you're not my big sister anymore. I disavow you as my older sibling. <laughs> okay. She's still your older sibling. She's still going to beat you up. It's a fact. Accept it. Allah in fact speaks the truth. And He in fact guides to the path. Call them by their father's names. Last names are important. Call them by their father's names. Don't, you adopt a child, don't change his name. Don't change his name. Call him by his father's name. It's important. This is a matter of identity in Islam. Fathers are part of identity in Islam. Because fatherhood determines, you know, uh, your, your place in society, your place in the family, inheritance law is related to it. So constitutional framework of sharia, the constitutional framework of it, depends on proper identification. And so you have to call people by their name. أُدْعُوهُمْ لِعَبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْسَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ That is closer with Allah. That's closer. So you, you, I just became Muslim, bro. My name used to be, you know, Smith. But now I want to become Samir. And my last name was Johnson, but I want to make it like Yahya. You don't have to. Johnson's fine. It's all good. You don't have to change your name. Smith is okay. It's cool. There's nothing Islamic about changing your name to Umar. Umar was pretty un-Islamic before he became Islamic. His un-Islamic name was also Umar, wasn't it? Salman al-Farsi had a fire worshipper name, Salman. After he became Muslim, nobody said to him, so what's your Muslim name? Oh no, wait, my Muslim name is what? Salman. Al-Farsi. Suhaib, before he comes from Rome, his name is? Suhaib. What's his Muslim name? Suhaib. So why you gotta mess with people? Why well, somebody becomes like the guy's name is Jack and he became Muslim? Jack, astaghfirullah al azim Ya akh, ghayir ismak. Change your name. You know, my, my, my college roommate, his name is Mark. He was, he, before he became my roommate, he became Muslim. He's Irish or something, Celtic Irish. Okay? So he became Muslim. And he was in, you know, some part of Michigan where they said, you have to have a Muslim name. So this is, you know, White guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, and he's, they go to masjid. So what's your Muslim? He says, Mark. What does Mark mean in Arabic? Well, in Celtic, Irish, it means warrior. So first sheikh named him Muharib. 
warrior. Then another sheikh came out, no, 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 I'll give you another name, Osama. 1995, his name gets named Osama. <laughs> What's your name, Osama? I call him Mark. There was a close friend of mine in, in Arkansas, really good friend, brother, brother uh, you know, DV. Oh, sorry, uh, John Goodell. John Goodell, really good friend, mashallah, great guy. Became Muslim. People ask him, so what's your Muslim name? John. Oh, what's your Muslim last name? Goodell. His daughter's name is uh, Trish, I think. His son's name is, I think, Mark also. It's all good. No problem. Nothing wrong with it. But you can't name Kufar names. Oh yeah? Desis? Do you find the name Chaudhary among any Sahaba or Chaudhary or no? Where did that come from? Parvez? Where did that come from, Parvez? It came from fire worshippers. It's a Persian name. Parveen? What Sahabi has named Parveen? Tell me. Where did these names come from? You get to do it. But any American name? Astaghfirullah. Chi Chi Chi. Tu Tu. Come on. This is double standards. So you don't call people by their names. Unless your name has something blasphemous in it, the guy's name was Christian. He became Muslim. <laughs> There's a need to change that name, okay? That, that makes sense. But if your name doesn't have blasphemy in it, leave it alone. There's nothing wrong with it. And it hurts the mother's feelings. The father's, we named you and you're just, it's not good enough for you now? The name we gave you is not good enough for you? At least if you have a religious justification for changing it, you can share with your mom, look, this word, this name no longer applies to me. I still love you and I will not change my last name ever. You know? So, ud'uhum li abayihim. And then people, you know, they adopt and they officially change the last name? Don't. Keep the original name. And they say, no, let the child will, you know, know uh, growing up, he'll know that he's adopted. You'll eventually have to tell him anyway. And then he storms out of the house, why didn't you tell me before? It's better to deal with these things at the right time and be, have integrity from the very beginning than to run into those problems later. وَدْعُوهُمْ لِأَبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْسَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And that's closer to fairness as far as Allah is concerned. فَإِن لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا أَبَاهُمْ Then if you don't even know their father's name, there's kids that are like, you know, victims of war. That just survived and they're put in an orphanage and then they're taken into homes. We don't even know who their fathers are. And then there's another situation of not knowing their fathers. You have a promiscuous society. You have illegitimate children. And the mother doesn't even know who the father is. You know? So not knowing the father's name is possible. فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ Then they're your brothers in religion. Give them any name but not yours. Then you're, they're still your brothers. They're still legitimate members of society. They're still respectable people, but you just you, you, you don't in, you don't hijack their name with yours. وَمَوَالِيكُمْ and they're your your close you know protective re relations still. وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ فِي مَا أَخْطَأْتُمْ بِهِ and there's no harm on you on the mistakes you've already made before revelation came. وَلَا and whatever you did by mistake. وَلَكِنْ مَا تَعَمَّدَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ whatever your hearts meant on purpose, you are firm and set. When you said those mean things, like it's one thing to shoot your mouth and just say things and then regret them later, it's another to actually mean it. And three months later, somebody says, when you called your wife, she's like your mother, you meant that? He goes, absolutely I meant it. That's the ammadat qulubukum. Yeah, Allah will get you for that one. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And Allah has always been extremely forgiving, always merciful. النَّبِيُّ أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ you know, I, I, these are situations for counselors. These are family counseling type situations. Uh, not too long ago, I was in a city. Brother came up to me and said, you know, there's a sister. She's got a couple of kids. Her husband out of nowhere just says, I hate my wife. And she's trying, she's trying to go to a counselor. She said, I'll do anything you want. You know, just, I just want to save this marriage. I don't want to ruin these kids' lives. And the husband says, I just don't like you anymore. I just don't like the way you look. I can't stand it. I want nothing to do with you. I want to advance my career, I want to do this or that or the other. And she's crying her head off, and she's like, what should I do, what can I do? I want to save this marriage. You know the surah began, Allah did not put two hearts inside of any man. 
First of all, I, I or anybody else is in no position to give people like that direct advice knowing like three sentences. Because these are life situations. Like two words you say can destroy a life. So don't, you guys also, don't think that you can give people marriage advice just like that. First of all, there are multiple sides to the story, always. And second of all, we, we, think of, we, don't th we think of divorce, we don't think of its consequences. We don't think of its psychological, emotional, economic, you know, familial consequences. We don't. People, don't, people at that time, well, all they see is their problem and they want it to end. Then when it ends, then they realize, oh my God, what have we done? And they regret it. So you, those things have to be handled with a lot of care. Now the Prophet is, we're being told about the Prophet and Nabiyu awla bil mu'mineen. The Prophet takes precedence to all believers. He is the first priority of all believers. They will lay down their lives before they let anything happen to the Prophet They will They will take any amount of beating before they tolerate insults coming to the Prophet The Prophet is supposed to have the highest priority to those who have belief. This is also mentioned because munafiqun were talking trash. And Allah says, actually, that's a pretty good idea. Pretty good thing you talk trash. Because the Prophet ﷺ is only a big priority to who? True believers. And you talking this way about the Prophet proves who you are. We don't have to check, look inside your heart anymore. We can just see from your tongues where you stand. They, are, they have a bigger precedent. The Prophet ﷺ is a bigger priority to the believers. Bigger than their own selves. And his spouses... His wives are their mothers, ummahatuhum. What does that mean? From, from then on, whether the Prophet ﷺ remains married to them or not, nobody can marry them again. They are haram upon the, 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 the rest. And this is not some guy saying, they're like my mother. Allah says they're your mother, it's done. It's done. You can't marry them anymore. وَأُولُوا الْأَرْحَامِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْضٍ And of course, the, the, the connections of the womb, they take precedence some over others in the Book of Allah. Meaning this policy, Allah decided that those are unmarriageable is only for the Prophet ﷺ. Everybody else, all other relationships are already described to you. They are, the, the closer family relations take priority in the Book of Allah. مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ Whether they be from, uh, from the believers, and those who migrated, those the believers, the new believers, and those who migrated. Illa an tafalu illa awliya ikum ma'rufa, except that you would do to your guardians, or you would do deal with your guardians in a way that is known, in the way that is known to be decent. So this the har business has to go. Kana da lika fil kitabi mastura. That has already been declared and written out documents. So to write something on a line. That has all all been lined out, specified for you in the law, in the book, meaning Surah Al Nisa. Most Mufassirun say. So Tun Nisa already told you who you can marry and who you cannot marry. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَخَالَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُ اللَّهُ وَبَنَاتُ الْأُخْتِ وَأُمَّهَاتُ you know, وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ مِنَ الرَّضَاعَ All of that's been listed out in Surah Al Nisa already. So you know who you can and cannot marry. That's already declared to you. And outside of that, you're fine to marry whoever else. So the Sahaba cannot say, well, I can't marry her because she was previously divorced and, you know, and she was with that Sahabi before. No, that's fine. And these ayats are telling us that remarriage is easy. Remar or at least it's supposed to be. Other than the restrictions that's, that have been placed, remarriage should not be a big deal. Children, grown children of divorced parents should not give their parents a hard time about them trying to get married. They shouldn't say, how could you do this to us? What do you mean? You, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't put pressure on them not to get married. If they're divorced and they want to get remarried, then you shouldn't get in the way of that, you know? It's no, no, but how could they do that? They were, it's, that's over. I know it's traumatic, but that marriage is over. It's done. You can't go back to that. Everybody has to move on and allow your parents to live their lives, you know? And when we took from, from all prophets their contracts, now look, this is something that Allah does elsewhere in the Qur'an in different places, but this is the one place in the Qur'an where both of those things came together. Allah talks about the marriage contract being وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْكُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Allah says the marriage contract in Surah An-Nisa is a heavy contract. A heavy, stern contract that is from Allah. And then there's another heavy contract mentioned in the Qur'an, and that is the contract taken from prophets that they will come to their nations and deliver the message. 
So there are two heavy contracts that are talked about in the Qur'an. What does Surah Al-Ahzab do? It talked about the marriage contract and how you shouldn't play around with that and just saying she's your mother doesn't break it. It's too strong a bond, too strong a contract to be broken just by careless, irresponsible speech. But additionally, now speaking of contracts, let me tell you, there's another contract. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِثَاقَهُمْ When we took an agreement from the Prophets. You see, all human beings have taken a contract with Allah. That's in Surah Al-A'raf. And when, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا All humanity was together. Prophets were there too. All of them said, Allah is our master. Then Allah chose among them the Prophets and took a second contract with them. وَمِنْكَ And we took that from you also. وَمِن نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمِ And we took that contract from Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, Nuh alayhi salam, all of them. وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا And we had taken a strong contract from them, a strong covenant from them. Mithaq, when both parties fully understand what they're getting into. That's what mithaq is. That's a specific kind of contract where both parties understand the seriousness and the clauses of the contract. Now when did this happen? Before we even came to the earth. The Prophet ﷺ were given this responsibility, their arwah. لِيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صِدْقِهِمْ So he can ask the truthful about their truth on Judgment Day. So everybody else can compare themselves. وَأَعَدَّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا And he has prepared for disbelievers a painful punishment. This was the first passage. And it somewhat started dealing with the controversy, that I, the supposed controversy, about the marriage of Zainab radiallahu anha. We're going to go back to that discussion in the fourth passage of the surah. So these middle two passages now are the larger problem that's happening. There's two issues. There's an internal domestic you know, uh, issue and then there is a like military advance happening against the, the Muslims. So let's talk a little bit about the battle of Al-Ahzab. I'll give you a little bit of uh, historical context. First of all, it happens in the fifth year after the Prophet migrated to Medina. Two major battles have already taken place. Badr and Uhud have already happened. And Banu Nuvayr, one of the Jewish tribes in Medina, is found guilty of treachery. They've, you know, because there's a joint pact in Medina of the Muslims defending one another and standing by Muslims and, you know, the Jewish tribes st st jointly defending the city of Medina. But Banu Nuvayr has been found guilty and it's been proven that they're treacherous and they're trying to plot with the Meccans and others to try to undermine the security of Medina and attack the Muslims and kind of play both sides. When they're found guilty, they are exiled. They're exiled, that's their punishment, because that was the treaty. So according to the treaty, the entire tribe has been exiled. And now they've been taken out of what used to be their home. Now, the, one of the leaders of, and this is, um, I believe they're also, I think they were Christians, I could be wrong. But Abu, Abu Amir Rahib, the, the, one of the heads, who was, I, I believe, a Christian, he is really, like he hates Muslims ever since they kicked him out of Medina and his people. And he wants to mobilize everybody else against the Muslims. So obviously, who will he go after that's easy, easy to convince that will come after the Muslims? Quraysh. So Abu Amr Rahib goes to Quraysh, and he convinces them, we should have a unified front, and we should come after the Muslims in Medina like never before. Let's just get rid of the problem. We hate them. We know you hate them. Let's do this. And other tribes all over, the, all over Arabia they're not going to listen to us. If we want to attack them, we don't have that kind of reputation. You guys do. If you guys are on board, we can use your reputation as a springboard to even get the tribes of Najd involved. Everybody, whoever's got spare armies, we can you know, combine all of them and offer them spoils of war and come and once, once and for all end the problem of the Muslims. Let's get rid of that problem. 313 versus 1,000 in Badr. 1 to 3 in, in, uh, in Uhud. But then in Ahzab, they amassed an army of 12,000 soldiers. 12,000 soldiers are now heading towards Medina. Now Medina is interesting, because if you want to imagine it, it's like I'll use these microphones as mountain ranges. Medina is in between these two mountain ranges. So two sides of Medina, the north and the south of Medina, are naturally protected. You can't advance with an army with horses and camels because the rock is black, it's burnt like, like from lava back in the day, and it's, it's, uh, it's slippery. So no armies can actually advance to Medina from the north and the south. So the two open borders left are then the east and the west. Those are the two borders left. Now, 
How many Muslims are inside? There's about 3,000. There's 3,000 Muslims that are inside Medina. How many armies coming? 12,000. 12,000. This is an insane situation. Now, two sides are protected, but two sides are unprotected. What's on the other side? So on the one side, the armies of Najd and the armies that are uh, from Quraysh, and this conglomerate is coming with their massive numbers. What's on the other side? That's Aqab. Behind Medina is Aqab. Ahead of it is Mecca. And that's where Banu Quraida are. Banu Quraida also in a, an agreement with the Muslims. They are in an agreement with the Muslims, but all signs are evidences. Banu Nuzair has been kicked out. The other tribe has been kicked out. They're thinking we should side with the Meccans also. And as the armies advance closer and closer and closer, the news comes from Banu Quraida that they've decided to attack the Muslims too. So we're worried about 12,000 coming from one end, and then the news comes the unprotected border, Banu Quraida, and they had pretty big forts in Banu Quraida, in Aqab. And some of the exiled tribes were living there too. They're coming to attack from the bottom too. And they were actually, um, the, the armies of, of, of Aqab, they, they, they had these hilly slopes. Like you know you have mountain ranges and you have a valley. But then you have mountain ranges and the land is a little bit higher. And so the armies are descending from that slope. Okay, That's what we're going to read about. That two armies are coming, one from above and one, one from above, literally, from the slopes, and one from below, meaning the Muslims, or the, the, the Quraysh, rather, the Meccans. Now, in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ is looking for suggestions on how to deal with this crisis situation. The hypocrites of Medina are like, oh my God, we're all going to get killed. There's not a single person remaining alive. This is, what gets, this is what you get for believing in this Prophet who said we're going to take over the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And Islam, there's not going to be a brick house or a mud house left that Islam will be in it. And will dominate. Yeah, right. Look at us. We're going to get executed right now. They started flipping out the, the hypocrites. The Prophet ﷺ asked for suggestions. And Salman al-Farisi, whose Muslim name is Salman al-Farisi, says to the Prophet ﷺ that in Iran, we've engaged in massive armies before small units engaging in massive armies. And what we do is we dig a gigantic trench at the border. And what that does is it doesn't allow that massive army to come flood the, the, the city because they have to go through the trench and come out. So only a few can come at a time, if at all. So we, we, we fight them in waves and we break their forces up into smaller digestible units. You know, So this is the suggestion given by Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. And that's why this battle is called the Battle of the Trench, Ghazbat al-Khunduq, the Trench. Now it's winter season in Medina, it's very cold. The, the, the crop is running low. The economic situation is tough. The Muslims are starving. And the entire city is on the project of digging this massive trench along with the Prophet ﷺ. They're going through a very, very difficult time. And as they are digging the trench, they are actually, you know how, have you ever seen workers like soldiers or, not, not soldiers, like construction workers, they sing together when they work? You ever hear that? Like they chant along with each other? Okay. نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا They had a chant. We're the ones that have pledged ourselves to Muhammad. عَلَى الْجِهَادِ مَا بَقِينَ أَبَدًا To a jihad that will remain forever and ever. We're ready to keep going. <laughs> Well, all right. And Sahabi comes and says, I haven't eaten for a couple of days to the Prophet ﷺ. And it's not like the Prophet ﷺ said, the trench should be over there. And you need to pick more up over there. He is going around holding large boulders on his chest. They're having a hard time breaking one of the boulders. And the Prophet says, give me the shovel Sallallahu And he hits it and it shatters. He is engaged in work. And the Sahabi comes and says, I haven't eaten for a couple of days, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ lifts his shirt. And he's got bellies tied, like stones tied to his belly, squeezing his tummy so he doesn't feel the crunch of his stomach. So he can keep working. SubhanAllah. What general does that? General's usually sitting in the camp, relaxing while the soldiers are at work. And he comes around once in a while to inspect their, inspect their progress. This is the mayor of the city, and he's involved like everybody else. So this massive trench is built. Now look at Allah's commentary. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, udhkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum. Oh, actually, no, before I get to the, this ayah, one more, th one more piece of history that you need to know. There is a, um, one of the Sahaba, let me see if I can dig up his name for you. Uh, 
I'll pull it out. I wrote it down and then I think I lost it. Anyhow, um, one of the Sahaba, uh, he was actually not from Medina. He's originally from one of the Jewish tribes. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I know the trench is good, but I think it might be good also if we can create some kind of hate among the Jews and the mushrikun of Mecca, the armies that are coming from the other side, if we can create some kind of media propaganda between the two. And I think I, can, I know how to pull that off. So the Prophet gives him permission. And he goes. And he goes to the, the, uh, uh, the Banu Khuraida first. And he says, so you guys, um, pretty sure that Muslims are going to be killed, huh? And they say, yeah, we're pretty sure. I mean, all signs are. And he says, you know, the last two times the Quraysh took a pretty bad beating. It hasn't worked out for the Quraysh last couple of times. Even if there's a 10% chance that the Muslims survive this, the Quraysh are going to go back home to Mecca. But you guys live here. Who do you think the Muslims are going to come after if the Muslims win? And he, they say, what's your point? I'm listening. The leaders say, we're listening. What's your point? Well, you know, the Quraysh, you need to have guarantees that they see this to, through to the end. That when the going gets tough, they don't just back off and run off. So you should request the Quraysh to send you, voluntarily send you, a couple of their key members to hold as hostages here in your town just so they know that they can't just run from this battlefield. You should do that, it's the sensible thing to do. They said, yeah, you, you know, you're right. You should do that. I can speak on your behalf to them if you want. Okay. He goes, to, he goes on the other side to the Quraysh. You know those Banu Quraida people from Medina? They're not even so sure if they're against Muhammad right now. And you know what they're asking you? They're asking you for hostages. They don't trust you. What? They don't trust us. And a friction is built between the two sides. Now the, 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 the armies of Quraysh and those, the, the conglomerate of all these other tribes, they're not as unified in their thought or as confident as they once were. Okay? So now let's get into the ayat themselves. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, udhkuru ni'matallahi alaykum. Those of you who have Iman, mention the favor of Allah on you. If ja'atkum junudun, when armies came at you, not one army, multiple armies came at you. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا وَجُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا Then we sent against them a wind, and armies that you couldn't even see. When the trench was camped out, the trench was remarkably successful. Horse riders couldn't get through, warriors couldn't get through, and there was a stalemate, and they figured if we keep the entire city surrounded, Long enough, they're going to run out of food and supplies. And then they're going to give themselves up. So we should just stick it out and keep, keep ourselves out there. Even if so much so they come near the ends of the city, near the trench to relieve themselves, we'll start shooting spears at them. So this was the, the hostage situation of Medina. And it lasted quite some time. And in this time, what Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us is, He started sending winds against them. And there's one cool story. I mean, there were no major fights. There was one guy, Amr bin Abdul Wad, Abdul Wad, or Abdul Wud, they call him too. He's a famous warrior of Quraysh. Famous horse rider, warrior, had killed many, never lost in battle. People were scared of him. Nobody ever fought him. He took his horse, and he went through the trench from the Quraysh side. He just went through the trench. Showed up on the other side. And he's standing right there in front of all of Medina. And then Ali radiallahu anhu speaks with him. And he says, I have three options for you. And he says, go ahead. He says, one, become Muslim. By the way, you know how old that guy was? He was 90. He was 90 years old and nobody looked at him in the eye. That guy was a beast. He was a scary old man. You seen like Gokhind in the video game? Scary old. He's on his horse and he's sword out. Become Muslim. He goes, that's not going to happen. Okay, we have option two. You can go back peacefully. That's not going to happen either. Ali radiallahu anhu says, then fight me. He laughs. The historians say he never laughed harder in his life. He goes, I didn't think anyone was alive in Arabia that would, have, that would be foolish enough to say those words. That would say, fight me. So Ali radiallahu anhu fights him one-on-one -on -one and kills him. And this destroyed the morale of the kuffar. Because Amr, he's going to bring somebody's head back with him. And he's taken out. He's taken and he's killed. And this was a public match. And they're, they're watching from the other side of the fence. You know, this epic one-on-one -on -one battle happens and done, finished. So this is, I mean, so we, we're not learning about hundreds of people fighting each other. There's kind of a stalemate. 
So after some time, the supplies of the, sol the soldiers thought the, Mus the Medina, the city, their supplies are going to run out. But the problem is, a city still has more supplies than a traveling army. You don't realize that if you're going to wait on them for three weeks to run out of groceries, you're going to run out of groceries a lot faster. <laughs> so now they're trying to cook some animals and do this or that, and Allah sends some winds. Uh, 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 you could say a tornado comes through Medina, or comes through this, this trench. And you know, somebody's trying to cook something and it flips over and it, the, the, the tent is on fire. The animals are running away. Chaos everywhere. And these guys are like, we can't just stay here like this. Two, three, four days in this wind, we can't be, we're, we're out of here. And most of those people, those 12,000, weren't Quraysh. And they weren't Banu Nuvayr. They were these other tribes that were convinced to come. So they're not, they don't have any motivation. They thought it was going to be easy money. So they said, forget this, this is not worth it, we're out of here. We're going back home. Allah says, we sent against them winds and an army. Armies you couldn't even see. Lam tarawha. At least you could see the winds because of the blowing sand. But the other army, the army of angels, the ones that literally picked up the stove and turned that one on fire, or literally slapped the camel so it runs away, with the tent tied to it. You know? That you didn't see. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا And Allah had been in full view of what you all were up to. Now Allah will describe in this next ayah so beautifully, what does it mean that Allah is in full view? إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْكِكُمْ When they were coming at you from above, from the plains. وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ And they were coming at you from in front, from, from underneath. Meaning under the trench and they're trying to come at you too. Now, these are two ends of a city. East and western end of a city. Which soldier you think has view to both ends of the city? Is there any one soldier in the city of Medina that can be keeping an eye on the western border and at the same time keeping an eye on the eastern border? No. Nowadays we have that advantage. How do we get a view of both ends of a city? Aerial view. You get the aerial satellite view. We are being given the satellite view of the battle in this ayah. If جَاءُكُمْ مِنْ فَوْكِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ well, if now, this is satellite view, and satellite view, okay, you guys use you know, maps.google.com, you can only zoom in so much before the resolution goes bad, yeah? You can't say, okay, I want to zoom into my house. And you go, zoom into my house, go through the roof, and I'm going to zoom into my kid's room, and zoom into the crib, I want to see if the baby's sleeping or what. And zoom into their eyes and see if they're fluttering. You can't do that. You can only zoom so much. Allah shows us this distant view. And in the very next words, He says, "If zaghatil absar," When the eyes were turning. It also means when eyes were getting petrified. Also means, you know, when, you, when you're so scared that your eyes don't even look at what's in front of you, they just kind of roll like, oh. Your eyes just roll up. When that was happening to the eyes. Is that a close-up? I mean, we were just the, in the satellite view, right? And now the camera is taken to the eyes of the guy that's scared, who hasn't even told anybody he's scared. His eyes are telling the story, and Allah captures that in the ayah. Which history book is going to tell you that? It's zaghat al But that's, at least somebody might be able to see the eyes. Allah's camera goes further. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ And hearts were reaching into throats. You could feel your heart pounding in your throat. Tick, 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 tick. Which camera is going to capture that? Which historian is going to know what's going on inside a person's heart? He could feel his chest pounding out of fear. He could see those massive armies, they'll come any second. وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ and uh, by the way, Al-Hanajir, Mablaghu Saud, they say, Mabathu Saud, where the, where the sound comes out from. You know why that's important? If the heart is stuck where the sound comes out, what doesn't come out now? You can't even talk. What's going on with you? Uh, 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 nothing. You're that scared, your voice doesn't come out. That's the state of fear. And on top of that, now let's zoom in further into the neurons finding it, firing in your brain. وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ and what, what kinds of bad assumptions you are making about Allah. The na is extended, you know, مبالغة, and what kind of horrible assumptions there were. 
that you guys were making about Allah. All kinds of thoughts were running in your mind. This is really, I mean, I thought Islam was the truth. And there's going to be the victory of Islam. And Makkah is going to be cleansed. And we're going to bring Islam to the Romans and the Persians, and this and that and the other. This game is over. We're done. And if that wasn't bad enough, there are still tribes inside Medina, especially Banu Quraidah, who were in an agreement up until the last minute, and now they've become an enemy. What are we going to do? We're finished. هُنَالِكَ ابْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Then and there, the true believers were placed under the most difficult test. You could argue that Ta'if was the most difficult physical, personal test for the Prophet ﷺ. And you could argue that Ahzab was the most difficult communal test for the Muslims. The individual test for the Prophet ﷺ, you could argue is Ta'if. And the hardest test for the Muslims in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ would be Tabuk. Or not Tabuk, this Ahzab. وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا shadida, And the earth beneath their feet were shaken and shaken intensely. زُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا shadida. They were, they were rattled with an, an intense earthquake, the earthquake of fear. And now Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ Then when the, and at the very moment when the hypocrites started talking, and those who have disease, a disease in their heart, وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ And those who have a disease in their heart, so there's two categories of people. The hypocrites and those who have a disease in their heart, those who are on the way of becoming fully certified hypocrites. They're not total absolute hypocrites yet, but they're, they're well on their way. They started talking too, the weak of the believers. And what did they say? مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Allah and His Messenger, you know, they didn't promise us anything but deception. What was the last ayah of the previous surah? You know? Don't let يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Don't let the ultimate deceiver deceive you. And what is the ultimate deception? That Islam is deception. That is the ultimate deception. When times got really tough, they said Allah and His Messenger didn't promise anything but deception. We got conned into this religion. What terrible fate it's brought our beautiful city. If قَالَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ Then among those hypocrites, there were some of the well-spoken. Like Abdullah bin Ubayy. And he says to his group, إِذْ قَالَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ When a group among them said, يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبْ Citizens of Yathrib. Yathrib is not the name of the city anymore. What's the name of the city? Medina. And when you say Medina, it means Medina to Nabi, city of the Prophet. They don't say, يَا أَهْلَ الْمَدِينَ They say, يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبْ It's the only time in the Qur'an the name Yathrib is used. Why? Because when the hypocrite sees, uh, speaks, he doesn't think of Medina as the city of the Prophet. He thinks of it as he used to think of it before the Prophet ever got there. And he's trying to call on the people's emotions and saying, we need to make it Yathrib again. Forget this Medina business. So he says, Ya Ahla Yathrib. Just using the word Yathrib in the surah opened up the fact that he's a hypocrite. Allah wanted to expose the hypocrites for what they are. The word Yathrib itself is an exposition of their hypocrisy. Ya Ahla Yathrib, La Muqama Lakum, you've got nowhere to go. You've got nowhere to go. Farji'u, then let's go back. Meaning, let's go back to the way things were. Let's go back to Banu Quraidah and say, No, 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 we're with you, forget the Muslims. Let's go back to restoring the order. I was about to be your king and Muhammad, well, let's just arrest him, Ma'adullah, and hand him over to the Meccans. Let's, let's turn back. وَيَسْتَأْذِنُوا فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمُ النَّبِيَّةِ So that's the outspoken one. But then there's some other weaker of faith. They come to the Prophet ﷺ, a group of them come, comes to the Prophet ﷺ, seeking permission from him. يَقُولُونَ They're saying, إِنَّ بُيُوتَنَا, بيوتنا عَوْرَ No, Rasul ﷺ, you know right back in the middle of the city, where Banu Quraida is going to attack from, our homes are exposed. Aura means a hole in the wall. Something you can penetrate through. Something that you can attack. The, the, the something that should be shielded or covered. That's why the woman, her, par, her privates are called awra. Man's private parts are called awra because they should be shielded or covered. So they say our homes are exposed. You know what the Prophet had done? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took all the women and all the children and he had them move to these large, there was this large mansion in the middle of the city. And he had it evacuated and he moved them all there for safekeeping. And he says, our homes are exposed. وَمَا هِيَ بِعَوْرَةً But they weren't exposed at all. He, they, they said, Ya Rasulullah, instead of us being guards at the, at the border, 
where the fighting might happen, maybe I should better do, I'll do a better job protecting the homes of the women and children in the middle of the city. Now once he goes into the middle of the city, he could hide under a mattress for all we know. He just doesn't, he wants to be excused from here. وَمَا هِيَ بِعَوْرَةً They're not, they're not uh, uh, exposed at all. إِنْ يُرِيدُونَ إِلَّا فِرَارًا They don't accept, they don't intend anything but to run away. That's what they want. You give them an excuse and they'll dash out of there. وَلَوْ دُخِلَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ أَقْطَارِهَا And if those armies, if they were entered upon from the boundaries, from those cities, if those lines were crossed, and the ends of the city, and both soldiers came in, and Muslims were all captured. Allah is giving the hypothetical situation. If all the Muslims were captured, and they were lined up together, and the armies, the rows and rows and rows of the armies came in into the city and flooded the city, and now 12,000 armed are surrounding 3,000, and their, their arms are laid down. ثُمَّ سُئِلُوا الْفِتْنَةَ Then they were, they, then they were questioned. Then they were asked to do the ultimate trial. In other words, leave Islam. At that point, if you were to be asked to leave Islam, like this Imam in New York, a Cambodian Imam who tells, tells the story of his brother, who was killed in Cambodia. You know, the, the communists, these rebels came through the village, they gathered everybody in the village, you know, men, women and children together, and they stood the Imam in front of all of them, and they had some pork and a bottle of beer. And they said, drink it in front of your people, to the Imam. And the Imam just raised his hand and he said to the people, لا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون Don't you dare die except that you're Muslims. And they shot him. If you were asked in that situation, if you were asked, ما تلبثوا بها إلا يسيرا They would have caved in. لا أتوها They would have caved in. They would have done it. And they wouldn't have تلبثا to spend time thinking about something. لبثا ما يجعل الله لهم لبثا وإقامة إلا وسيرا الله would not have given them any firmness they wouldn't have taken any time to say let me consider my options yeah of course no 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 we're not Muslim anymore sorry 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 didn't mean it I'm all yours that's what they would have done this is Allah describing the people who said let's go let me go back and protect our homes that that تلبث بالأمر نقول بالعربية تأخر وتمهل أيضا Talabbatha means to take your time, to think things through, to ponder over them. Allah says, وَمَا تَلَبَّثُوا بِهَا They would not have pondered anything at all about leaving Islam if their life was on the line. إِلَّا يَسِيرًا Except very little. It'll be very, it'll, except it would have been a very easy decision for them. Yeah, well, thank God. I was kind of like, you guys are here now, I can truly express myself. I was kind of not, not liking this whole Islam thing anyway. Who needs it? They would have sold out. Now this is not to say when your life is in danger that you cannot say kalimat of kufr. Because we know that there are precedents for that. But you as a people, this is now Muslims as a people. You know, not a Muslim as an individual. Now we're standing together. Now if one falls, everybody falls. You know, that's, it's not that you cannot compare that to an isolated individual case. Because this is now the solidarity of an entire nation. وَلَقَدْ كَانُوا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ قَبْلُ And they had, these were the very people that had made the strong promise, the mutual promise with Allah from way before. لَا يُوَلُّونَ الْأَدْبَارِ That they're not going to be turning their backs. وَكَانَ عَهْدُ اللَّهِ مَسْؤُولًا But the promise of Allah is something that was always going to be asked about. Meaning whether you were tested or not, the intent for showing, showing your backs and not running off, you will be interrogated about. قُلْ لَنْ يَنْفَعَكُمُ الْفِرَارُ إِنْ فَرَرْتُمْ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ أَوِ الْقَتْلِ Tell them, your running away is not going to benefit you. If, even if you run away from death or being killed right now, if you flee from the battlefield right now, مَفَرْ is a place of shelter. فَرَّ to get shelter from the war, from war or from conflict. وَإِذَنْ And even if you got away from being killed, or you, you got away from dying, then even if that happened, لَا تُمَتَّعُونَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You would not be given t utilities to enjoy a life, a new home, some, some more air to breathe, except very little. And then you'd be standing in front of Allah. قُلْ Tell them, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَعْصِمُكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ Who's gonna protect you from the disaster that Allah brings? You think this is a disaster? How are you gonna run when Allah brings His disaster at you? Who's going to isma to protect from disaster? تَدُلُّ عَلَى الْإِمْسَاقِ وَالْمَنْعَ It alludes to holding back and preventing the harm to come from somebody. Who's going to prevent harm from you then? إِنْ أَرَادَ بِكُمْ سُوءًا أَوْ أَرَادَ بِكُمْ رَحْمًا If he intends harm for you, you know the, bad, the worst thing to happen to you, or he intends that love and mercy be shown to you. 
ولا يجدون لهم من دون الله وليا ولا نصيرا and you will not find or they will not find for themselves other than Allah any protective friend any aid this is said because they were looking for an other protective friend and another aid the hypocrites of Medina last ayah inshallah ta'ala I'll give you your break قَدْ يَعْلَمُ اللَّهُ الْمُعَوِّقِينَ مِنْكُمْ Allah very well knows about those, the mu'awwiqeen, the ones who يَضَعُ الْعَوَائِقَ عَائِقَ in Arabic is an obstacle, a distraction. يَضَعُ الْعَوَائِقَ أَمَامَ مُرَادِكَ وَيُثَبِّتْ هِمَّتَكَ وَيُخَذِّلَكَ What it means is someone who puts uh, uh, like obstacles in your path, Second, it means someone who demotivates you, frustrates you, takes away your motivation. So there are those among you that are stopping others from good. Awwaqa also to prevent somebody from good deeds. So here it means those who are a, they're destroying the morale of the Muslims. You have to be strong in the emergency situation, not cry. Allah knows who, those who are sitting back among you. وَالْقَائِلِينَ لِإِخْوَانِهِمْ And those that are saying to their brothers, halumma ilayna. Just come to us, just come to us, don't fight with them. Forget this whole Islam thing. Halumma come on over here. Tadunnu ala sayha. Halumma, the word alludes to yelling. Like, hey, come on, come on, forget this battle. Let's go hide, man, this is over. Wala yatuna al ba'sa illa qalila. And they won't, they won't come to war, they won't come to the battlefield except very, very little. Like they'll show up, see what's going on, and say, yeah, I'm out of here. And you better come with me, bro, if you know what's good for you. They don't, they, they're nothing to do with battle. So the 3,000 that we have in Medina are full of troublemakers. So you've got big trouble outside on one end, big trouble outside on the other end, and you've got major problems inside. People already ready to give in to the enemy and saying, we're with you. If you want, we'll attack the Muslims right now. We'll help you out. We'll find you another way into the city. These, these are the problems the Muslims... When Allah says they were shaken thoroughly, everything... Everything falling apart, all at the same time. SubhanAllah. This is no joke, this incident. But this incident, as we will learn inshaAllah ta'ala, is probably the major turning point in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the major turning point. A lot of things came as a result of this event that ensured, guaranteed the victory of the Prophet ﷺ. So the, the tides are turning because of this one major event. I'll give you your last break. And we'll try to do a few more ayat of Surah Al-Ahzab. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Because they were